So I'll just I'll just say a few words, Joe, because actually when we do this in uh, Trieste, it's uh, it's really a school, and you know we we don't really do a lot a lot of introductions, but I'm going to do it anyway, <laughs> uh, just for everybody to know. If you haven't looked up uh, Joe Shaw's biography, he's a distinguished professor of electrical and computer engineering. Uh, affiliate professor of physics and the director of the Optical Technology Center, all at Montana State University. He's uh, won uh, many, many awards, including the Gigi Stokes Award from SPIE, the Graduate Student Mentoring Award. Uh, he was a Presidential Early Career Award uh, in 1998. He's a fellow of uh, Optica or OSA at the time, and also a fellow of SPIE. And what you may not know, but uh, now that I know it, uh, when next time we're in person, uh, Joe also is a musician, plays the guitar, and bass, and a little bit of saxophone. Joe, we need a we need another we need a guitarist, we need a bassist, and we need we could use another saxophone player. So next time we we do this in Trieste, I'll get you and Stephen Hill to come down. Both of well, you. That sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, we. I tried with Eugene to get Stephen Hill here to play sax, <laughs> but uh, it didn't work. Uh, he, we, we, he wasn't biting. At any rate, um, so well that that's it. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, there's just so many awards. Uh, anyway, I'm going to give it to you, Joe. It's just uh, it's your show. You got uh, two talks, two lectures, and however you want to. I'll just let you go. Um, so anyway, I'm turning it over to turning it over to Joe. Good. Excited. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here with you all. I wish I was in person so that I could see you each. It's, it's easier when I can see your faces and, and respond to what you're thinking and, and what you're saying. Um, I don't mind if people ask questions as I go. So if there's, I mean, this is, this is a school, so this is not this is not a lecture for me to give to you. It's for me to give to you and you to ask me. So please ask questions if you have them. Uh, Joe, I assume that's okay if we do it that way. Absolutely. As I said, you're in charge. And so I think okay. uh, maybe they can raise their hand and Abdul, you you can. Yeah, yeah, I'll handle that. If okay. anyone raises his hand, he can ask uh, in between. Okay, perfect. Wonderful, thank you. So if, if I have the schedule right, and I, I think I do, the, the first one this morning is going to be about LIDAR for autonomous vehicles, and the second one will be atmospheric LIDAR, and then tomorrow we're going to talk some more about some different LIDAR applications. So this is, this is one that is very new. The, the LIDAR, LIDARs have been used since the 1960s. You know, of course, we celebrated yesterday, the International Day of Light, and that marks the anniversary of the first laser. And as soon as the laser existed, people started using them for LIDARs. I mean, it didn't take very long at all for somebody to get that idea. So this is kind of what we're going to do is we're gonna talk about some basic principles and sort of calculations for how, how we calculate LIDAR signals. Then I'm going to talk about geometric factors and resolution. And then we'll talk about different kinds of LIDARs, including how to scan LIDARs. And, and then we'll, we'll end with a brief discussion of coherent LIDAR. The, <clears throat> excuse me. The autonomous vehicle LIDAR world is very different from any other LIDAR world and it, it, it poses unique requirements and I will, I will try to review those. But first, let me tell you where I am coming from. Um, I, I live in Bozeman, Montana in the United States and that's right here. Uh, Yellowstone National Park is a famous place that some of you may have heard of and that's right here, just south of my home. It turns out that I'm actually talking to you from Arizona though. I'm way down here right now because I had to go and visit my parents and help them because they're getting pretty old. And so I'm actually in Arizona, but I, but I usually live in Montana. And my place, Bozeman, Montana is a, is a 
great place. Of course, the university has some great facilities, but what I like to brag about is the, is the outdoors. I like to ski both cross country and downhill and hike in the summertime. It's a, it's a good place. And if, if you ever are in this direction, I would be, uh, I would be happy to have you come visit me. I'm going to play a video working, at least it's working for me. I hope you see the video playing and I will play it a couple times so that if, if you don't understand it, you might start to understand it. This is a video that was created with LIDAR data <clears throat> on a car. And it's, it's played back faster than it was recorded, of course, but Okay, so it looks like it's just playing over and over again. The thing that, <clears throat> the, the thing that, uh, maybe I can pause it. No, the thing that you might notice is just how dark the world is. There's not, you, you feel like you're driving at night with poor headlights. And that's because the LIDAR only sees, in this case, forward. It does not look to the side. It does not look back. In, in a more general case, in a more general case, a LIDAR on an autonomous vehicle, you know, the purpose of the LIDAR is to act as the eyes. Of course, there's a famous quote by Elon Musk saying that a LIDAR is a fool's errand. And he thinks that LIDARs are too expensive and too complex and will never be successfully used for self-driving vehicles. But I, I and many others disagree with him because they give, you, they give you the ability to see at night. They give you the ability to see farther away than just with a camera, especially in poor conditions. I think the combination of cameras and LIDARs are the, the best thing. So the, the principle or the requirements that people usually agree on for self-driving car LIDARs is that it needs to scan the scene around the vehicle and update that scene approximately 10 times per second. So think about that. That's a lot of data. Uh, that's a lot of pointing LIDARs in different directions. So that's a very different requirement than than LIDARs for atmospheric measurements like we'll talk about in the next hour. It's very different. And it, the requirements then drive the design of the system. Not only that, but the system has to be small. It has to fit on the vehicle and it has to be fairly low cost. The, the goal I think in the community is to get these LIDARs down to maybe speaking in US dollars, maybe a few hundred dollars. And right now we are not very close to that price point. So we have a lot of work to do to develop LIDARs that can do self-driving vehicles. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> this is kind of a general layout of, of how a LIDAR would be designed for this application. Of course, the optics, there's, met, there's a lot of sophisticated things to think about with the optics, but here it's just shown as a single lens. But, but let's, let's start here with a pulsed laser. This is what drives the system. Not all LIDARs use pulsed lasers, but I do want you to know that many and maybe even most do. So we will talk about pulsed lasers and then at the end of the day, I will talk to you about a different kind of LIDAR that does not use pulses. But pulsed lasers then will send out laser pulses that are collimated and directed by the optics. There's gonna be scan mirrors and that kind of thing. The, the light goes out, hits some, something in the world, bounces some light all over the place. That's the thing to remember is that the light goes all over the place. Only a tiny bit of the light comes back to the receiver. <clears throat> the distance, between the target and the receiver can be written as the speed of light times delta T. And what is delta T? Delta T is the distance. 
uh, or sorry, the, the time that it takes to travel. And then it, you have to divide by two because the light is going out and back. It's going two ways. So if we measure delta t, we can just multiply by the speed of light and divide by two and we get the distance. So what does a LIDAR do? Fundamentally, it measures distance and we can measure much more than distance, but that's the fundamental thing that we're measuring is distance. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing is some electronics. In this case, uh, single photon avalanche diodes are shown. There's a lot of uh, photonic devices that are being developed to help LIDARs be more effective and, and lower cost. And then I'm gonna skip the basic front end circuitry. This is the key difference between the LIDARs that I'll talk about today, this morning, and the LIDARs that I'll talk about in just one hour from now. Instead of recording the whole waveform, a self-driving car LIDAR will typically use a time to digital converter. And so this is just an electronic chip and you put the pulse in, you, when, when the laser fires, there's an electronic pulse that is created to start counting. And then when the optical pulse comes back and triggers the electronics, it records the time between the, the start and stop. And that's the time that is used over here to calculate the distance. So we don't know what happened between the optics and the target. All we know is the time that it took to, to hit some target. That's, that's an important difference from what I'll talk about in the next hour. And the reason is that if you have to record the whole waveform, it becomes very expensive and there are significant trade-offs between the bit depth, so the dynamic range and the speed. Okay. So that's what we're measuring is delta T, the difference between these two pulses. Okay, so let me, I'm not going to give you a whole hour of equations, but we do need to talk about some equations to start with. So let's start with a cartoon. We have a laser over here. It puts out some power, power of the source. It has a divergence angle, theta sub B, range R to the hard target. It has an area that the beam has a cross-sectional area, A sub B. There's a A sub T, which is the area of the target. Rho sub T is the reflectance of the target. And then the light comes back, gets collected by some optics with area, area of the receiver, focal length F and detector area. Those are the parameters we will use. The first version of this is going to be with the receiver field of view filled by the target and filled by the laser beam. So you can see the field of view of the laser, or the, the field of view of the receiver is completely full with light, reflected light. And then the next case, we will change that. Okay, so the first thing I do when I'm developing an equation like this is I, I, I think in terms of radiometric quantities, I'm using the optical engineering convention, which some of you will be familiar with and some of you will not be familiar with. But in that convention, we use E to represent irradiance. And so what I'm saying is, this is irradiance in watts per meter squared. So we have the power of the laser divided by the beam area. So the power of the source divided by the cross-sectional area. So that's going to be a function of range. And then we have to multiply by the transmittance of the path, the atmospheric path. And so now I can change that equation to be, I can replace the area of the beam with just pi times the radius squared. And the radius is just the range times the angle, as long as I'm starting from zero beam size down here. And that's an easy modification. So all of a sudden we have a range dependence. This is where the range dependence comes in is from the divergence of the laser beam. So now we are already proportional to one over R squared. Okay, so what do we have? We have irradiance incident on the target. So now we're going to reflect that by multiplying by the reflectivity 
And then we are going to turn it into radiance L. Radiance is watts per meter squared per solid angle, per stair radian. And so we have to divide, the numerator is the reflected irradiance and the denominator pi is the projected solid angle of a hemisphere. That says that the light gets scattered in equal, equally into all angles of the downward facing hemisphere. And that, that, that's the assumption that I made to make this simple. This is Lambertian target. That means that the radiance is scattered uniformly into all angles. That's not true for most uh, materials or most objects, but it's a good simple approximation to make. If it's not a Lambertian surface, we have to use something else here that is called the bidirectional reflectance distribution function or BRDF. And that's fine. If we, if we need to do that, we can do that. But for simplicity, I'm going to use a Lambertian assumption. So now you put in this equation, you, you insert this equation for E sub T, and now we have this equation on the right. The next step is we're going to propagate that radiance from the object down through the throughput of the receiver. The throughput is the area times the projected solid angle. So this, there are two different versions we could use, but I will use the area of the receiver. That's the pupil area of your collecting telescope. And omega will be the projected solid angle of this field of view. Since the field of view is full, we can define the solid angle with the detector area and the focal length. And we have to multiply by the transmittance of the atmosphere again, because we're coming back. And we have to multiply by the optics transmittance. I say approximately equal to here because I'm using a small angle approximation for this solid angle. The projected solid angle is approximately equal to the detector area divided by focal length squared. There are exact equations that I derive in my longer class, but we don't need it because this is actually a very good approximation as long as the angles are small. Okay, so then we can put this equation into this equation and we get our final answer. And I need to move the faces so I can I, I do two more things. I, I replace the receiver area with pi times the diameter of the receiver squared over four. That's just pi r squared, but using the diameter. And I'm going to recognize that the focal length divided by the diameter of the pupil is the, fo is the f number of my receiver. So in, in this equation, I have used those two. They're not approximations, but those are just two equalities. So now I have it written in terms of the dimensions and the, pro the parameters that I usually know for my system. So note that it is proportional to the laser power. So the easiest way to increase the signal is to use a brighter laser. But of course that can cause problems because we cannot send out so much laser light that we are we, for, for a self-driving car in the civilized world, we have to use eye-safe lasers. Um, detector area is in the numerator. The things that are in the denominator include range squared. So as the range gets larger, the signal gets very rapidly smaller. The divergence angle and the F number. And then notice that we have T sub A squared that's the atmospheric transmittance squared. That's because we go out and back. So we get multiplied by it twice. Okay, so the, the main thing that I want you to recognize here is that we are proportional to one over range squared because in the next version, that's going to change. So I will move to the next version. The next version, this is exaggerated, of course, but just to make the point. In this case, the only thing we're going to change is we're going to make the receiver field of view much larger so that now the field of view of the receiver is larger than the target and larger than the beam of light illuminating the target. What happens in this case? This is not a normal situation. We 
we usually don't try to design LIDARs this way. But with radars, it's almost always this way. And because of the longer wavelength and larger diffraction angles. And so with radars, this form of the equation that we will develop here is very, very common. But with LIDAR, it's not so common. <clears throat> but it's important to understand. Okay, we start with our reflected radiance equation, which is the same equation from the previous slide, because the transmitter is the same. All of that is the same. So we start with radiance reflected by the object. And now we multiply by the throughput, the A omega product, also known as A ton du, of the receiver. But now I'm going to make the only change that I have to make here is for the solid angle. Instead of using the full solid angle of my full field of view, which is larger than my target, I have to use the solid angle shown in red. These red lines indicate the solid angle that I need to use. That's the solid angle subtended by the illuminated spot on the target. So that's going to be the area of the target divided by range squared. Notice that we already have range squared up here. We have range squared here so that when we put the two together, we actually have range squared and range squared. So our final equation is going to be proportional to one over range to the fourth power. So with LIDAR, we either have one over R squared or possibly one over R to the four. So this is even worse, isn't it? That if we double the range, we get two to the four. So what is that? 16 times less power. So we, our signal falls off very rapidly with distance in this case. All right, so that's pretty much all the slides with heavy duty equations. Well, I guess I have one more. If we take that equation for the power and we divide it by the noise equivalent power of our detector, then we can calculate the signal to noise ratio. And so then we can solve this equation for R we have R squared in the denominator. We just solved for R. And we say the maximum range is there for all this ratio where we are using signal to noise ratio threshold. Some, maybe we have, a, maybe we make the decision that our algorithms are reliable only for a signal to noise ratio greater than 10, for example. Then we would put 10 in here, calculate all these numbers and find the maximum range. Notice that the maximum range equation has a reflectivity. Obviously, right? Because a brighter object is easier to see than a dark object. Right now, lots of companies are trying to tell us lots of things about how good their LIDARs are. And so you see very frequently claims that this LIDAR can detect objects out to 300 meters. And somebody else says, oh, mine only detects out to 200 meters. Well, that doesn't mean anything. We have to know what the object is. Is it reflective? What is the reflectivity? And is it Lambertian or what? We can also do the underfilled case and we get a fourth root, right? Same, same equation, just fourth root. <clears throat> there also is a minimum range. And at the at the most fundamental, the minimum range is limited by how fast we can start the electronics. But it's also limited by the overlap between the receiver and the transmitter. And I'll explain that to you next. So there is a maximum range, but there also is a minimum range. And many people do not realize that there is a minimum range. Okay, so these are examples that I took from on the left of a journal paper. And on the right, just an example from a company. And these are good examples. These, these are shown with the information that you need to understand it. So let's start with the left one. These are calculations for a small LIDAR with a three centimeter diameter aperture, a target with 30% reflectance, and a, a uh, detector receiver 
or sorry, this is the laser divergence, 0.5 milliradians laser divergence. And you use those equations that I just showed you the, in the first slide to calculate the signal. Then what they're doing here is they're expressing their signal in terms of photons. My equation was in terms of power. So power is energy per time, so joules per second. All you have to do is multiply, <clears throat> or sorry, divide by the photon energy, h nu, Planck's constant times the optical frequency. And <clears throat> you can turn those equations that I gave you into photons per second. Then you multiply by however many fractions of a second you are collecting light and you get photons. So that's how to convert those equations to this graph. This is a logarithmic vertical axis because that makes the, the one over r squared behavior become linear. And so now we see with range on the, on the bottom, in fact, this is a logarithmic axis also. So with this log log plot, we get these straight lines showing the signal as a function of range. What these different lines are for is different energy levels. So one nanojoule pulse energy gives us this purple line. Uh, one microjoule, much larger energy, gives us this line up here. So the way to read this graph is that the, here's this, this solid line is the NEI. So that's the noise equivalent irradiance. And they are saying this is a photon equivalent. So they are calculating a noise equivalent. Hopefully you, most of you know that kind of terminology. When you see something called the noise equivalent power, it is the optical power required to create a signal to noise ratio of one. And in this case, it's the, it's the irradiance required to produce a no, signal to noise ratio of one. And signal to noise ratio is the mean signal divided by the standard deviation of the noise or the standard deviation of the signal, which we call the noise. So we don't want a signal to noise ratio of one usually, but using a signal to noise ratio of one is a really good reference point. So this is signal to noise ratio of one. And then somebody came along and said, we want, we want a signal to noise, we want a larger signal to noise ratio. And so we're going to increase it up here. So this horizontal dashed line represents the threshold. And that's the threshold that, that the user has to decide based on how reliable they think their algorithms are. So in this case, it's saying that we need to detect about 100 photons to be reliable. Well, with a one nanojoule pulse, that means that your maximum range is, you know, what is this? Maybe 20, maybe 20 meters? With 10 nanojoule range, or sorry, 10 nanojoule pulse energy, we get a larger range, maybe 90 or maybe 100 meters. If we go all the way up to one microjoule, then we intersect these two lines at almost 1,000 meters. But you may not be able to do one microjoule because you either cannot afford that laser, it costs too much money, or it takes too much electrical power, or more likely, it puts out so much light that it's not eye safe. And we cannot drive a car down the street in a, in a city or even in a countryside with, with lasers that are going to blind people. Okay, so this is, this is the kind of design curves that we use as LIDAR designers to determine what the performance is of our LIDAR. On the right is the same type of curves, but in this case, we have a logarithmic vertical axis for amplitude, that's proportional to the signal, and a linear axis on the horizontal for distance. And so we see the curve instead of a straight line. Now we're not using different laser pulse energies. What we're doing is these curves are all for different targets. So the top one is for reflective tape. 
Reflective tape has a very high reflectivity, but even more important, it is designed to be retro reflective. So this is a retro reflective target. If we said that our threshold was, let's say 10 to the one, that's what this number is right here, 10 to the one. If that was our threshold, the retro reflective tape would be detectable out to a range of 100 meters. This is for an actual commercial LIDAR. So it would be able to detect that type of material out to 100 meters. But you cannot assume that everybody's wearing a coat or a shirt made of retro reflective tape. So you need to detect people wearing dark clothing. And so you need to look at some of these other things, like let's go all the way to the bottom, Kodak gray card, 18%. This is, a, this is commonly used in calibrating cameras they were developed originally by Kodak company for calibrating the auto exposure system for cameras. 18% reflectance is about the average of the world around us. So that's kind of a typical value for everything in the world. And they don't tell us what they're, they're not assuming anything. They're probably making measurements in the lab, but the Kodak gray card is quite Lambertian. The reflective tape is not Lambertian. It's much better lamp than Lambertian. So with the Lambertian 18% reflective object, you can see that if our threshold were 10 to the one, we would only have a maximum range of about 10 meters. So this, this might be a very nice little LIDAR, but it's not very, it's not going to see things effectively very far away. And these are the kind of objects that we have to see in real life is things like people wearing dark shirts. So you can see that the problem that we have, depending on how fast you're driving and how complex the scene is, usually self-driving car LIDARs are designed to have 200 or 300 meter range. So that's the challenge. These, these quotes down at the bottom are not talking about this system. These are quotes from different marketing materials that I put here just to show you that these are the kinds of things that I see people saying or writing about their LIDARs that don't make any sense. Designed for highway scenarios with road tracking out to 80 meters, lanes to 150 meters, and objects to 250 meters. Well, what is an object? What kind of object? Is it this or is it this, or is it something in between? So this isn't enough information. Here's some quote that says that they detect something at a distance of up to 200 meters. Well, again, they're not giving you enough information. And then can track objects up to 100 meters away. What kind of object? So you can see that the, the companies need to give us more information if we're going to really do a good job of comparing one LIDAR to another. This is a big problem right now. There, there are no standards in this business. LIDARs are just being built and people are telling us how good they are, but they're not using the same standards. So we are some of, there's a group of us who are in the process of trying to do some experiments and generate some standards for autonomous vehicle LIDARs. Okay, so let's, Let's talk a little bit about some geometric factors. The first one is overlap. This is the illustrated here. Here's my transmit optics. Here's my receive optics. The transmit beam diverges as it goes out. The field of view of my receiver gets larger as it goes out. And at this distance, they start to overlap. At this distance, the, the entire laser beam is contained within the field of view of the LIDAR. This is called the full overlap distance. This is the partial overlap distance. And at ranges shorter than that distance, we don't get really any signal at all. So this is the minimum distance, and then this is the full overlap distance. Um, this is something that you could solve partly by using monostatic optics, which means you use the same optics for the transmitter and receiver. But even that does not solve the problem entirely. And the reason is that 
when an object is up close, the receiver is not focused properly. And so you don't get all the light. So it's still only a partial overlap, even with monostatic receivers. Okay, so the next geometric quantity we should talk about is range resolution. We said that we're talking about measuring range. How accurately can we measure range? Do we measure range perfectly or is there some uncertainty? And the answer is, of course, there's uncertainty delta R. If, we're, if we are not limited by the electronics, which Actually, before about five years ago, many LIDARs, if not most LIDARs, were limited by the electronics. But if, if the electronics are fast enough, then the range resolution is limited by the bandwidth of the receiver. Now, that's a theoretical statement that doesn't make a lot of sense unless we talk about what is this bandwidth. This is the electronic bandwidth, not the optical bandwidth, first of all. So in a pulsed laser system, that means that delta R is C delta T over two times the refractive index in the denominator. Delta T is the pulse width of our laser. So that's, it, that's how long the pulse is in time. So a typical value for a lot of my LIDARs is about a nanosecond. And that means that the range resolution is about 15 centimeters in air with n equal to one. In water, that gets compressed and becomes smaller. And we'll talk about some LIDARs used in water later today, or I guess that's tomorrow. <clears throat> However, for self-driving cars and cars and trucks and space vehicles, whatever, autonomous vehicles, we're looking at hard targets this, this is the best range resolution you can get for distributed scattering, meaning if we are scattering from particles in the atmosphere. But if we're looking at hard targets, we know that that pulse is hitting its, with its front first. So we can detect the edge of that pulse and we can improve the range resolution from 15 centimeters to you know maybe one or two centimeters. So actually you will, fairly frequently see people talking about uh, autonomous vehicle LIDARs with range resolution of a couple of centimeters. And that has to do with how sharp the edges are on the, on the laser pulse. Um, okay, this is one that, that is not very important for, for self-driving car LIDARs, but it, it can be an issue, so let's talk about it. The maximum unambiguous range is the range that we can measure with one pulse before the second pulse starts giving us a signal. So if I have pulse number one shown in blue and pulse number two shown in red, I understand that some people may not see the difference between those colors, and so I will talk about them as number one and number two. If we send out pulse number one and it reflects from this far away object and the pulse starts coming back. And meanwhile, we send out pulse number two and it reflects from this nearby object. It's possible that we will get both pulses back to the receiver at the same time and we will be confused. We won't know if we're looking at pulse number one or pulse number two. So the important thing is that you have to make sure that the spacing, which is tau, the time spacing between pulses has to be large enough that pulse number one is gone and the signal has faded away to zero before we launch pulse number two. And so the, the range for that to be true is the speed of light by the time between the pulses. In, in historical atmospheric LIDARs, this was not a problem because we very rarely fired pulses more often than 10 or maybe 100 times per second. But with a lot of these, uh, with a lot of these LIDARs for autonomous vehicles, of course, we're trying to scan the whole scene about 10 times per second. 
And so we are shooting laser pulses much faster. And quite often we're using diode lasers that can be fired at a rate of, let's say 10 kilohertz. So 10,000 times per second. That makes this problem become important. Okay, this is one that you don't hardly ever see in any textbooks or anybody's papers, but it turns out for a self-driving car LIDAR, it's extremely important. Let's say we have a LIDAR with a single laser and that laser is being scanned with a scan mirror. So the laser pulse comes out, bounces off the scan mirror and reflects off of the object comes back and by the time it reaches the scan mirror, if the scanner is ro rotating rapidly, by the time it comes back, we have this situation where it comes back, the scan mirror has moved so that now the received light is not received. The backscattered light misses the field of view of the light up. So this only becomes a problem if this scan mirror is, is going very quickly. But again, we're trying to do very rapid scanning with self-driving car LIDARs. So this is, it turns out, a very, very major problem for autonomous vehicle LIDARs. So over on the right side, I have an example. Let's say the field of view of our LIDAR receiver is 10 micro radians. That's very small. But that's what we do with LIDAR receivers. Very frequently, we only have micro radians for field of view. And the reason is the wider the field of view, the more background light you get. And the more background light you get, the harder it is to detect your laser light. So let's start with 10 micro radian field of view. Let's assume a range of 150 meters and <clears throat> So 150 meters using the speed of light, three times 10 to the eight meters per second, means that the propagation time from the LIDAR to the object and back is one microsecond. And so in one microsecond, the signal will be lost if the scan rate is higher than the field of view divided by that time, one microsecond. And that tells us 10 radians per second, which is 173 degrees per second, which is 1.6 revolutions per second. So call this two, two revolutions per second. That means those, the laser is spinning two times a second. That's not very fast. There are many, 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 many lasers that spin faster than that for laser scanners. So that means we have a big problem if we actually try to do this. What this tells you is that you really don't want to design a LIDAR to see the whole world around you with one beam. You really wanna use multiple lasers. And that's why so many designs now, now are using multiple lasers, especially with diode lasers. We can build a, an array of diode lasers. Okay, so let's talk about lasers. With, with autonomous vehicles, the LIDARs need to be small. So we need our lasers to be small. And therefore we almost always use diode lasers. Sometimes we'll use a fiber laser, but that's still a diode laser with fiber. And diode lasers are nice because they're small, they're efficiency, they're easy to modulate, they're low cost. Uh, we can use vertical cavity so, so, uh, surface emitting lasers to have superior beam uniformity, but they have low optical power, which limits the range. And they have highly elliptical beams, at least diodes, uh, edge emitting diodes do. So we need some prisms and lenses to make the beam circular. And we need a small, or we have a small emitting area, which means that because of diffraction, we have high divergence. So you need collimating lenses. So these are all the problems of diode lasers. Um, 
Down here on the bottom left is shown a plot of the amplitude of the diode laser beam versus angle. And what we're showing here is that there is a one, one dimension has a very wide beam and the other dimension has a very narrow beam. That means we have a highly elliptical beam and we have to fix that. Um, but you know that can be fixed. Fiber lasers use a diode, a seed diode to generate the, the wavelength that we want and a pump diode so that we can generate more power. They're brought together with a wave, wavelength division multiplexer in this case. And we have some active doped fiber so that there's optical gain in the fiber. And then we can have one stage, two stages, we can have any number of stages of amplifiers. And out of that last stage then comes We can generate a nice, and also we're coming out of the fiber, so the beam is nice and circular and symmetric. So th this is commonly done at the 1550 nanometer wavelength range because all of this stuff exists at low cost because of optical telecommunications. And again, I have to mention laser eye safety. There are many plots we could show for eye safety, but this general one shows the maximum permissible exposure in joules per area versus wavelength. And so you see that for these are different pulse widths or pulse durations. If you pick one of these pulse durations, let's say one microsecond, you see that in the visible wavelengths, the allowable energy is much lower than over here in the near infrared. And what that tells you is that there is an advantage for using 1550 lasers because we can put out, you know, many, we can put out much higher pulse energy without, without causing a threat to a human observer. Of course, the, the, the threat we're talking about here is that the light is focused by the lens of our eye onto the retina. And if you focus high energy onto the retina, you will burn your retina and cause permanent damage. So because of this, many people argue that 1550 nanometer is the best wavelength to use because we can use higher energy. But that's not always the case, that it's not always the case that it's better. The two wavelengths that are, that are most commonly used with autonomous vehicle LIDARs are 1550 nanometers using optical telecom devices and about eight or 900 nanometers using just standard near infrared diode lasers. Okay, I need to move a little more quickly here, but. Uh, I don't need you to understand all the details here. The purpose of this plot is just simply to show you that this is, this is from 1992, this is an old picture, but it shows you that even back then people were thinking about how to do LIDARs with multiple lasers. They have 25 lasers. There's 25 diode lasers. This is a scan mirror that is rotating. This is, this is a way of getting around that problem we talked about with lag angle loss. Instead of scanning one laser to see the world, here now we are scanning 25 lasers in a fan. So we have a vertical fan of beams and they are scanning horizontally all at once. So from the very early days, this has been an approach that has been used. A similar approach was commercialized uh, later than that. This is a picture of a commercial LIDAR that you can still buy today. And this is made by Velodyne, which is one of the companies that is out there selling LIDARs for autonomous vehicles. It uses 64 diode lasers in a vertical fan. So we have 64 lasers in this fan pointing down and up to horizontal. And this top goes around in a circle continuously. So the idea is that you can use this to 
see the world around a vehicle. Um, they are claiming 120 meters maximum range, although they don't say for what reflectivity. The range uncertainty is two centimeters. That's about what we talked about earlier. But that same company and other companies are making, are, are moving in new directions these days. The big rotating LIDAR, this costs about 70 or $80,000. It's more money than the car. So you can't afford to put that on a car. So they are making a smaller version. They're making a very small version that has a wide angle lens so that they can see behind a vehicle. And they're making small handheld versions. The idea in the industry these days is to make smaller, lower cost LIDARs so that you can have multiple LIDARs instead of just one. So the idea is replace one big expensive LIDAR with multiple small, low cost LIDARs. And how do we scan the beams? One option is with a MEMS mirror, microelectromechanical systems. And this is, uh, this is showing a monostatic use where the same optics are used for the transmit beam and receive beam. This is bistatic where we transmit the beam off the scan mirror and collect the light off of a separate receiver. Why not use phased arrays? instead of moving a mirror. In radar, we, we just change the phase of the antenna elements and we can, by putting a phase gradient, you take a Fourier transform of the phase gradient and you get a tilt. So you can steer the beam. And just by electronically tuning these elements, we can scan the beam. That's what these are here. These are phased array antennas on these Navy ships and on this airplane. All radars in the modern world mostly use this technique now, but that's because the wavelengths are long and we can make the devices. In the optical world, the devices are too small because the wavelengths are so small and we end up being limited by grading modes so that we can get about 23 degrees scanning for a phased array in one axis and a three or four degrees in the other axis. So this is a challenge. Lots of people are working on it and there are some clever ideas out there, but fundamentally physics is preventing us from making easy low cost phased arrays. So one solution is shown in this patent here by a recent company if, if you can only make a phased array that scans over 20 degrees, why not just make them low cost, make them small and cheap enough that you can put many of them together. So you don't need one phased array to cover the whole 180 degrees scan angle. You can use many different phased arrays. So that's one solution. Another solution that's been, been being explored by this company I am not here to promote any company, but I'm just giving you examples. This is a very interesting uh, company because what they're using is dispersive optics. So think like a prism. If you pass light through a prism and if you tune your laser, then the, the, as, you, as you tune the frequency or wavelength of your laser, you will change the scan angle. And that's what they're doing. They're using they're using dispersive optics to do angle scanning with a frequency tuned laser. Okay, so let's talk briefly about uh, flash LIDAR. Flash LIDAR is where you send out a cone of light to illuminate your entire scene all at once. And so these are pictures from a commercial company that sells flash LIDARs and illustrating the, the, the use. The advantages are that you capture your entire scene in one frame with no scanning. So this avoids the use of a scanner. And that's good because mechanical scanners will break eventually. But, oh, and the other advantage is that you don't really need as much stability in your system as you do with a mechanical scanner. But the huge disadvantage is that you have greatly reduced energy density per pixel because 
you're, you're spreading all your light out into a large cone. But for near range LIDAR, this is a really, really good way to do it because it allows you to see everything in the near field of the LIDAR immediately. And so again, in my field of remote sensing, we believe that no, you never solve all of your problems with one sensor. There's always multiple sensors required. Here's an example of that. Here's a space probe that is landing autonomously and it has a Doppler LiDAR for navigation. It has a uh, flash LiDAR for landing and it has a laser altimeter also for landing. Why does it use three different LiDARs? The laser altimeter is a single beam that tells you the distance to the surface when you're very far away. The flash LiDAR only operates when you're close to the surface and it gives you an image like this so that you can very quickly adjust where you're landing so that you don't land on a rock or in a crater. The Doppler LiDAR is for measuring velocities as you're moving across the surface. So we need three different LiDARs for three different purposes. Okay, I want to briefly mention Geiger mode. Everything I've talked to you about so far has been linear mode LiDAR. This is a nonlinear mode where you drive an avalanche photodiode with very large reverse bias. And the advantage is that it, it gives you, when you get a single photon incident on the detector, it gives you a flood of electrons. So you have very, very high sensitivity. So very high sensitivity means you can have a very small system. You get very high range resolution because of the sharp pulses that come out of this detector. We don't need any kind of analog processing, but the disadvantages are we only get a single return per pulse. And I think the biggest one is this detector dead time. The, the Geiger mode detector will give you a pulse and then it has to reset and it takes time to reset. But people are very smart and they're working around these problems and Geiger mode LIDARs are looking to be very, very powerful. Here, here's an illustration that shows you how a linear mode operates. If you have a bright laser pulse, it's easy to distinguish it from the noise. If we have a weak laser pulse, it gets buried in the noise and an even weaker pulse gets buried even more in the noise. With a Geiger mode, we get a bright pulse, regardless of whether it's weak, medium, or strong. And so we can detect single photons. And I'm gonna skip those. I have one last thing I wanna talk about. We're just about out of time, but I want to talk very briefly about coherent LIDAR. Um, with coherent LIDAR, we actually make use of the coherent properties of the light. And so what we do is we transmit a laser beam and we pick off a piece of that transmitted light as the local oscillator. We mix it on a detector with scattered light and the mixture gives us the product. The, the, it gives us the square of the product and that gives us a sum and a difference frequency. The sum is, is too high to detect. But the difference frequency is our signal frequency, that's our optical frequency, minus our local oscillator frequency. And so we can, we can detect the light. The advantages of, the advantages of, of doing coherent detection is that it's insensitive to background light because we only are coherent with our signal. The dominant noise is shot noise and we get automatic Doppler measurements. But the cost that we pay is that it requires very precise alignment. We have very limited field of view and we have more system complexity. However, I would point out that these disadvantages largely go away if we implement the coherent LIDAR all in fiber, then the alignment becomes much simpler. Um, this is 
in that slide a few minutes ago, that, that spacecraft, I showed you that it had a flash LIDAR and then it also had a Doppler LIDAR. The, li the Doppler LIDAR is using a coherent method. And what it's doing is splitting its signal three ways so that it has three different beams. And those, you can see that on the left here, there's beam number one, two, and three. And that way we are able to get three different components of the vector motion so that we get a velocity vector out of our measurement. Um, I don't have time to go into this in detail, but there's a method that uses CW lasers, continuous wave lasers. And we chirp the, we chirp the frequency so that it goes beep, beep. Right, the frequency is going up and down, and the copy comes back at a delayed time. The coherent mixing gives us a beat frequency, so that the Fourier transform gives us the beat frequency, which we can interpret as range. The beat frequency is, in fact, proportional to range, as this equation shows. So we can measure range by measuring the frequency of our beat. And the last thing I'll show you here is that the, um, let's see, I need, the, the range resolution is inversely proportional to the chirp bandwidth delta F. So if you can figure out how to chirp a laser over a large optical bandwidth, you can achieve very, very fine range resolution. And, um, the only thing I want to show you now is just that we also get uh, we also get the velocity for free, and so I'm going to let this play. This is a video that was created by some of my former students, who operate a company selling self-driving car lidars, and they use this technique, the FMCW technique. And so as this person moves away from the light, the lidar is on the left looking to the right. So this is blue shifted, red shifted. You can see the, the velocity being determined. And I see that, that uh, Henry Pinedo has, uh, has his hand up. So I'm happy to try to answer that question. Uh, OK, uh, there is a uh, question from Henry. Uh, I think uh, Henry, you can unmute yes. and ask uh, directly from the speaker. Yeah, yes, thank you. I, I didn't want to interrupt uh, while was describing this movie. Um, please, uh, I would like to know uh, what uh, what type of lidar are used for wind velocity estimation. This is something that I am attempting to to know more about. Uh, what type of solutions are uh, of, the, of this type of lidar you presented are used? and how feasible are them to, to build uh, for estimating wind velocities. My, the goal is just to, to estimate the energy potential for, for wind, uh, wind energy potential, basically. Please. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question and very timely. Um, in the next section, we will talk about atmospheric LIDARs and I will talk a little bit about wind LIDARs. Uh, this method can be used the method that I just talked about. Many, many wind LIDARs use coherent detection because you get the Doppler shift automatically. There are also um, some incoherent methods for detecting winds. And I can't remember if I have slides about that in my atmospheric section, but I think I might. So, and, and there are companies that make these. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly, mature technology. So there, are, why don't we hold more details on that question until the next section when we talk about atmospheric LIDAR? Good question. I see that we have Dr. Concertini with us today too. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, my, I have two questions. One is very small. In the beginning, when you present the formulas, there is uh, the square of the atmospheric transmission. And then there is another T sub zero. What is this? That's the transmittance of the optics. 
Ah, oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, because and, you know, with our right. interference filter yeah. and all yeah, these yeah, things, yeah. that course. might only be fifty percent. So of course. no, but I saw this. Uh, it's a, and the second question is is different. Um, these uh, lasers work uh, in the infrared. In the near infrared, in one case, uh, or in the far infrared, in the other case. So, do the short distance. Uh, there should be no effect from the turbulence, from the atmospheric turbulence. Unless there are special situations, like let's say in an airport where you are behind an airplane, and in this case, this could be a big disturbance. Is this true? I think it is true, and, and you know more, much more about turbulence than I do, but it's... Uh... <laughs> It's, it's true that over such short distances, it would be pretty negligible most times. But if we were behind an airplane, if we had a region of, of high thermal high thermal changes, we, I think it would become very important. And I think in that case, then the coherent LIDAR would suffer the most maybe, but. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting point. Uh, okay, I think uh, uh, and if anyone still want to ask a question, okay, there is another question from uh, Hugo. Uh, Hugo, you can unmute and ask directly, please. Thank you very much for the talk. Very informative. At the very last, uh, at the very last slide, you mentioned about frequency modulated continuous wave. In this case, instead of using fast Fourier transforms, would you use uh, chirp Z transforms, which are generally the more general form of FFTs? Yeah, yeah, good. I, I don't know right off the top of my head what the, let's see, Z transforms would be a discrete version of that. So yeah, I guess technically we could develop that theory in terms of Z transforms. Um, I know when we implement it, we implement it with a fast Fourier transform. And I think though that that would be an interesting thing to do is to develop the theory using Z transforms. I think you would get the same kind of answer. Yeah, that's a good point. And I put my email in the chat so that if anybody wants to send me additional questions, they can. Okay. Uh, and then there's also a question in the chat, Abdul. Yes. Um, is there any equivalent to synthetic aperture radar? The answer is yes. And I have never worked on it, but it's called synthetic aperture LIDAR. And there is some work being done on that area. And number two, in the basic ranging application, headed changes of the index. Oh, yeah. Same. That, that has to do. Um, Changes of the index of refraction change the speed of light, and so all of the all of the ranging equations have the index in them. And then fluctuations of that index, of course, can manifest as turbulence, and that's what uh, Dr. Concertini and I were briefly mentioning. Okay, uh, there is another question, uh, Joseph Shah. If you can answer, uh, what kind of a lidar used? for the detection of PM 2.5 particles in environment? Oh, um, that really brings us into the atmospheric LIDAR world. And we, we can measure backscattering at multiple wavelengths, minimum two wavelengths. And by looking at the ratio of the backscatter signal, at the two wavelengths, you can get some information about the particle sizes. And so this has actually been done using NIDJAG lasers at 532 nanometers and 1064 nanometers. And the ratio of those two wavelengths will tell you some information about the particle size. And that's, that's relevant to the PM 2.5 question. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for all the answers that uh, the question for the questions. Uh, the and, and we asked. will we okay. will talk 
we will talk more about that topic. Yeah, 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 sure, in, sure. In oh, still, uh, if any participant want to ask a question, he or she can raise hand so that uh, I can let you ask directly from the speaker. Um, okay, I think uh, uh, no more questions for now. So, uh, Joe, I think you can uh, proceed whether we should uh, stop or the talk should continue. No, I, I, well, that's up to, to Joe or Shah, but I think we can just keep going. Uh, okay, that's great. We just led right into it with those questions, so it's good timing. Yeah, I, 